Good afternoon, or good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are listening today. Thank you all for joining me today for the ninth of our Columbia CBIPS lecture series on social justice and the AC industry. I'm Fenioski Peñamora, Executive Director of Columbia Center for Buildings, Infrastructure, and Public Space, and Armstrong Professor of Civil Engineering and Engineering Mechanics at the Food Foundation School of Engineering and Applied Science. As the events of the last month has demonstrated, we are living during exceedingly challenging times, characterized by divides, distrust, and distancing. However far apart we have been, however far apart we currently are, we need to learn to come together, to be together, to act together for social, economic, and environmental justice. The faculty and staff of the Center for Buildings, Infrastructure, and Public Space we like to add our voices to those describing institutionalized racism in the AC industry. Today, our industry has challenging work ahead to achieve true racial and gender inclusion. We need to stand with our architects, engineers, contractors, and suppliers from underrepresented and marginalized communities. We need to incorporate the lessons of diversity and build a better future for our industry characterized by respect, opportunity, and collaboration. From mid-May to early September, our COVID-19 lecture series brought together um, to address the impact, response, recovery, and preparedness of the architecture, engineering, and construction community in regard to the coronavirus pandemic. The 19 weekly lectures in the series can be seen on our website cbips.engineering.colombia.edu. Today, as we continue and finalize our series on social justice and the AAC industry, I would like to thank the organizations with whom we have been collaborating in presenting these lectures. They are the American Council of Engineering Companies, New York, the American Institute of Architects, New York chapter, the American Society of Civil Engineers, the Consortium for Sustainable Urbanization, Engineering News Record, the National Academy of Construction, and NICOVA NOMA, the National Organization of Minority Architects here in New York. From the lecture on September 22nd by Justin Garrett Moore to last week's talk by Joel Sanders, our program on the AC industry and social justice has focused on issues of activism, community participation, social inclusion in engineering practice, needed change in education of architects and engineers and advocacy for racial justice in the architecture, engineering and construction professions. Recording of the seven lectures in the series are also on the CBIPS website. Today, we broaden our definition and focus on inclusive design. The co-moderator and respondent today is Dr. Jorge Vanegas, Dr. Vanegas graduated in 1979 with a degree in architecture from the Universidad de los Andes in Bogota. He's a registered architect in Colombia. He pursued graduate studies in the construction engineering and management program of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Stanford University, uh, California, graduating with an MS degree in 1985 and a PhD degree in 1988. He's currently a tenure professor in the Department of Architecture since January 2006. And in addition, he has appointment as a research professor in the Texas Engineering Experiment Station of the Texas A&M University System since September 2011. In July 2009, Dr. Banegas began an appointment as Dean of the College of Architecture at Texas A&M, uh, having served as interim Dean from August 2008 to July 2009. In July 2013, he was reappointed for a second term as dean, and on January 2017, he was reappointed for a third term as dean. Before joining Texas A&M, Dr. Vanegas held academic appointments at Purdue University and the Georgia Institute of Technology. In August 1988, he joined Purdue University in Indiana, and from 1988 to 1993, he held appointment as a assistant professor Subsequently, so in May 1993, he joined Georgia Tech with an appointment as an associate professor and was granted uh, tenure in 1996. Held the Fred and Teresa Estrada professorship in the College of Engineering from 1999 to 2005 and was promoted to full professor in 2005. 
So thank you, Jorge, for being with us today. Now the screen is yours. Thank you, Vinyoski. <clears throat> for everyone, the speaker today is Victor Caliz. As commissioner of the New York City Major's Office for People with Disabilities, Victor Caliz has been an advocate for people with disabilities in both the Bloomberg and de Blasio administrations. Responsible for ensuring that New York City is the most accessible city in the world, Caliz advises the mayor and agency partners on accessibility issues, spearheads public-private partnerships, and chairs the Accessibility Committee of the city's building code. Commissioner Caliz began his city service working with the Capital Projects Division of the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation, where he led efforts to make one of the largest and most complex park systems in the world accessible by ensuring compliance with the construction standards, managing facilities, and developing training materials. Prior to working in New York City government, he was a disability advocate in the nonprofit sector. Caliz has facilitated relationships with businesses in a myriad of sectors, including technology, finance, government, and healthcare. His leadership led to the creation of the New York City at Work Employment Initiative, the first public-private partnership that directly connects job seekers with disabilities and businesses. The commissioner also consistently engages with innovators in digital accessibility, communications, and autonomous vehicle development in order to ensure that accessibility remains a priority in technological advancement. A recognized experts on disability, the commissioner regularly consults with high level stakeholders regarding accessibility. He is frequently invited to national and international conferences and has given numerous keynote speeches. Pat about the human rights of people with disabilities, Commissioner Caliz supports the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and works with international partners to ensure that people with disabilities are mainstreamed into society. The Commissioner received a Bachelor of Science in Sports Management from St. John's University and a Master of Arts in Urban Affairs from Queens College, City University of New York. Khalees, an avid athlete, competed in the 1998 Paralympic Games in Nagano, Japan, as a member of the first US national sled hockey team. A more detailed bio is on the CVIPS website. Thanks, Victor, for being with us today. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, Jorge. I appreciate um, you inviting me here today, as well as Fanyoski. Thank you as well. Jorge, just to let you know, um, I did hear that you're from Bogota, Colombia. And uh, I recently did some work with Mayor Peñalosa um, a couple of years back uh, um, on the Transme cable that's there now. Um, and one of the most uh, interesting things that was there was that it wasn't just one car that was accessible. They made every car on the transmit cable um, accessible. So it was really delightful to see and them um, moving the bar forward and realizing that accessibility is for all. So uh, I just wanted to point that out because uh, I, um, I love my time that was there and Bogota was a great city. Thank you. Um, so, and uh, Fenyoski, thank you as well. Um, your time of working with Department of Design and Construction and really paying attention to the details of uh, making New York City the most accessible city in the world is, uh, is, is, is partly due to you as well. So thank you for your, your commitment. Thank and you, Rick Bell as well. <laughs> yeah. And Rick Bell is uh, also um, on our, was on our uh, committee as well. So I just wanna uh, pay respect to the people that came before me or with me for that matter. So um, we're talking about uh, the mayor's office for people with disabilities and social justice and inclusion. And this is uh, certainly the time. There's a, there's a lot of unrest in our country, in our world uh, around social justice. And um, we need to make sure that the voices are heard. And when we're talking about diversity and inclusion, I want everybody to think when they hear it. And um, it is certainly the way that we need to move forward in our society to make sure that everyone's included. But as you listen to those conversations, Listen really deeply, and I guarantee 
that you will never hear that disability is mentioned in that diversity. And disability needs to, um, because disability rights are civil rights. And in 1990, um, people with disabilities, our civil rights um, were finally paid attention to with the signing of the Americans with Disabilities Act by George um, H. Bush. And um, very, very fitting that we're having this conversation because it's 30 years since the ADA has been passed. And the ADA covers five titles. Employment, how do you employ people with disabilities? I will tell you that 80% of people with disabilities throughout the United States or, or somewhere close to that, the numbers have gone up and down between 78 and 80, um, between the working age of 16 and, and 64 are jobless. Imagine that. It's a poverty issue and people with disabilities have really not moved forward in the employment sector uh, since the signing of the ADA. There's Title II. How do states and local governments, such as my office and our city, provide for people with disabilities any programs and services and design and construction under Title II have to adhere to the accessible guidelines um, through the Americans with Disabilities Act? Public accommodations, the places that we go out to, um, our restaurants, our shopping facilities, are they accessible for people with disabilities? Our doctor's office, are our telecommunications accessible? Sort of like the platforms that we have today um, that we're on right now. And looking at that in a way to say, is it accessible for people who are deaf and hard of hearing? Is captionings embedded um, or put into this? Is uh, American Sign Language uh, available upon request? Does this platform work for people with visual disabilities? And so on and so forth. And Title V is miscellaneous provisions. So where does, what does the role of local government play? Well, my office has been around since 1972, 73, excuse me. And our job is to be resources to people. How do we make sure that uh, when a person is calling our office, they have uh, what they need to be able to get information from the Department of Transportation and Parks Department. But we go over and beyond that. So we wanna make sure that New York City is the most accessible city in the world. And we've come out and finally held ourselves responsible with an annual, annual report called Accessible NYC. And it's a state of persons with disabilities in New York City. So how do we run through our sidewalks or make our parks accessible or our transportation or our taxis accessible, our cultural institutions. And this is the work that we do every day. And we put out a report and you can see it at um, myc.gov slash accessible NYC with four reports to date. And we're coming out with our fifth report by the end of this year. And it really is a comprehensive look about what New York City is doing. And it's focused on transportation, employment, financial empowerment, housing, healthcare, access to city services, education, and technology. So um, I wanna talk about the lack of accessibility. So right away, you would look at um, Four Freedoms Park is on uh, Roosevelt Island and it overlooks uh, the United Nations. And um, some, one would come to this park and say that it's not accessible because of uh, the picture that we're showing right now, our steps. Well, there are ramps to the left and right, um, but there are lots of accessibility issues with this, specifically on the Southern end. This park was um, designed by Lewis Kahn to talk about our only disabled president, Roosevelt. And it talks about the four freedoms and it's strategically placed on the Southern end to look over the United Nations. Now on the most Southern end, um, they have this area called the Haha. -ha. Um, and it is, um, and it gets you down closer to the water and a user experience that is unlike being on top. Um, they eventually, they originally was built with steps to go down and then, um, they redesigned it to have ramps. And when they built it, um, they showed us a ramp design. And at the last minute it was pulled out and steps were put in. 
um, this uh, turned out to be a lot of controversy and Four Freedoms Park was sued um, on this. And um, unfortunate because they took ramps out. And if you think about what this was, this was our only disabled president in a wheelchair and how it wasn't accessible to people with disabilities was unfortunate, um, especially since the original design that was presented had ramps. Uh, there was a big lawsuit about it and um, it led to them putting up a glass partition um, where unfortunately no one um, will be able to use and get down to the haha. -ha. Um, a flaw in design should not happen, um, but there had to be re um, remediations to this due to a lawsuit that was presented. So when building things like this, make sure it includes accessibility for everyone. I wanna talk about Central Park. It's one of the jewels of New York City. And the Central Park Conservancy works very close with the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities, specifically in all their designs. Now, they uh, go through a lot of parks and this uh, park at face value would not look accessible because of the different tiers uh, that are here. But in fact, it is. The Conservancy works with us They've, um, they make sure that people with disabilities can actually move through the spaces and everything that they do. And they have old playgrounds that they redesign to include accessibility. And that's just the Central Park Conservancy side. The New York City Department of Parks and Recreation, which controls over um, 30,000 acres of parks within the city of New York and is the principal provider for open space throughout the city, I would argue is the most accessible park system in the world. That's a little pompous, but I am a pompous New Yorker. Um, and I can say that because I started my career off at the parks department. And the parks department has come up with a set of standards that goes over and beyond accessibility. This is a picture of Imagination Playground. And as you can see, um, this has a lot of different areas. Uh, it, um, if you look over to one side, they have a lot of ground level play equipment. You will see a ramp that actually moves through the space. Um, and it actually has um, adaptive play equipment where kids with disabilities and anyone for that matter can play um, with these pieces of equipment and imagine playgrounds in the way that they want to. And um, there is a, a sandy area in there and there is a, actually a path of travel through that sandy area where everyone can play. And as you can see, there's um, uh, right here is a Playground 123, which is in um, the upper part of Manhattan. And uh, they have steps and ramps that are through there that allow everyone to play. Uh, there's a Laurelton Playground in Queens. And uh, they got all these play features uh, that are there with accessible spots for people in wheelchairs to sit next to, water features that are ground level, um, ramp systems that are above ground but really allow kids with disabilities and their peers to run the, through this space just like everyone else. The High Line, which happens to be a great park in Manhattan that stretches from Gansevoort Street all the way through 34th Street and an abandoned railroad is fully accessible for people with disabilities. And the image that's up right now is this sitting area that goes for, uh, it's about, um, about 19th Street that starts off high and comes down low. Um, sort of like an amphitheater. And the interesting part about this design um, is it looks like steps. Uh, and on the far end of this picture, you will see steps. Yes, you do. But what you don't realize, or maybe you do, is that is actually, this stadium seating is actually a ramp system. Blended in design, that's hard to detect, but is fully accessible for anyone that actually wants to go through it. I cannot tell you how many times I go there and show people about this beautiful design and they do not realize it's a ramp system. And it's integrated perfectly through this design. As we reimagine our streets in New York City, we have to ensure it's accessible to people with disabilities. 42nd Street has never been 
as accessible it is now, as it is now. It's flat. They have signage up directing people with disabilities which way to go. There's accessible um, areas where you can go throughout everything. And we're excited to see that our open streets really encompass the idea that people with disabilities are just like anyone else. We work extensively with our museums. And through our cultural plan, we have made sure that it includes people with disabilities. Um, not only in their design and construction, but also are they hiring people with disabilities? Do they have programs that allow for people with disabilities to partake in them? Meaning, um, do, are they putting loop systems in, in their galleries for people who are deaf and hard of hearing? Do they have touch tours that are through there? Um, what's the accessibility when they are doing their museums over and are they adhering to the American with Disabilities Act accessibility guidelines? And how do artists with disabilities integrate into this system? So we make sure that we do this. We work with our rich museum systems from, off, um, uh, from um, small museum systems to big museum systems to ensure that accessibility is embedded in all that they are able to do and that our cultural plan addresses people with disabilities. I um, am very committed to accessibility in our transportation system. And um, I am now um, a, a voting board member to the, math, uh, to the Metropolitan Transportation Authority. So we have a lot of work to be able to do right now. And in this fiscal crisis that's happening right now, um, it is very tough to be able to add accessibility um, on lots of areas. Um, the MTA is committed to 100 key stations by the end of 2020, and we will get there. But the reality is this, that there are over 465 stations throughout the system and only 120 of them are accessible. So we have a long way to go to meet accessibility. Prior to the uh, pandemic, the MTA committed to making 70, sta 70 stations accessible within five years, which would have left a person with a disability no more than two stops away from an accessible station. And that's extraordinary, and we need to get to that again. But unfortunately, with the pandemic, it, there's, there is, it really isn't any light at the tunnel. And hopefully, our federal government steps up to the plate and will be able to really help fill the gaps of the billions of dollars that the MTA is in the hole with right now due to loss in revenue um, and everything else that is happening during the pandemic. But we have to think differently. And right now, city planning, um, the MTA, our office is advocating for new zoning laws that will allow for buildings that are building over a subway station or next to a subway station or within a area to be able to use our zoning and, and build incentives in to ensuring that we can add more accessibility. We need a lot of actors at play here. It can't just be the city, it can't just be the MTA. It has to be the MTA developers, um, city planning, uh, the way that we build in New York City to ensure that we are adding more accessible elevators. Why? Because there are a million people, oh, close to a million people with disabilities in New York City. And as we age, we wanna be able to age in place. And we wanna be able to ensure that everybody, people with disabilities, the aging community, parents with strollers, people that are traveling throughout our city are, and our tourists have the ability to get into an elevator to get up and down into our system in an effective way. So these zoning laws combined with city planning, state, city, and federal government needs to be able to step up to the plate to be able to make sure that we are adding accessibility everywhere we can um, in our zoning. Accessible taxis. We're the only city in the world to ensure that ride-sharing companies adhere to accessibility standards. Now, what does that mean? Well, there's the yellow taxi industry, which 50% um, of the yellow taxis um, 
are moving towards accessibility, but the yellow field is definitely having some challenges here. But we've added a bunch of accessibility, uh, thousands and thousands of wheelchair accessible taxis in the yellow and green taxi industry. And the for hire vehicle system needs to be accessible as well. That is the ride sharing apps. And they, they cannot an, add any new vehicles on the street right now unless they are an accessible taxi, which has elevated um, the way that people with disabilities get taxis on the street. Prior to adding taxis, the argument was that people with disabilities didn't ride taxis. Well, why didn't people with disabilities ride taxis? Because they were never available. And then people would argue that there's a usage problem with this. We, we don't know what the demand is. Well, you don't know what the demand is because you've never provided accessible taxis. So last year alone, we, we in the four hire vehicle and the yellow and green taxi vehicle, we added over 12,000 trips at about $12,000 in the average trip, which leads to over um, uh, $3 million. If we just think about that alone, and those are only things we could track. There are people that have held accessible taxis on the street that we don't even know about. We created a market that was never there before. And to say that there is no money in disability, that it only costs money is wrong. It's a chicken and egg thing, right? What comes first? Well, if you, if you add a system that's accessible on the street, um, people with disabilities will use it. As we imagine our streetscape, reimagine our streetscape, it certainly needs to be accessible for people with disabilities. We have assessed over 200,000 curb cuts on the streets of New York City. And we did that with a lot of smart city technology, LIDAR technology that uh, looked at many different um, ranges of the curb cut. And we have a plan right now to make all of our curb cuts accessible throughout the city of New York. But we had, it to find, we had to find out what wasn't accessible and what was accessible. So using technology for our streetscape is important. As we open up streets and, and put new bike lanes in there, we have to ensure that they adhere to people um, with visual disabilities and hearing disabilities and making sure that we can cross the streets in safe zones and having breaks um, throughout that. So we're totally involved with our Department of Transportation and ensuring that happens. And through our Vision Zero initiative to, to reduce the deaths, um, traffic deaths in New York City. And as we reimagine our streetscape, um, especially now during uh, the pandemic, is all restaurants need to be accessible. We have um, certainly been involved in all the conversation and have put out regulations on the streets of New York City to ensure that these outdoor restaurant facilities are accessible. And if you look at the photos that you're looking at now, you'll notice that these places did not adhere to accessibility. We cannot move forward and build new forms of, of dining and shopping that's not accessible for people with disabilities. Of course, we know um, who these bad actors are and we are um, exercising our city rights to go after them and to ensure that accessibility is there. But I just wanna point out that you cannot build things on the streets of the city of New York that are not accessible to people with disabilities that do not have the right path of travel and our street and sidewalks are becoming more congested due to coronavirus. And we have to ensure that they are accessible and the paths of travel are accessible for people with disabilities. As we um, built our 9-11 memorial, um, it's important to make sure that these structures are accessible for people with disabilities. And if you are a person um, who can stand or is uh, an able body, you can get to the sides of the 9-11 Memorial like these officers are right now, and you can oversee the reflecting pool. But if you happen to be a person in a wheelchair or a walker, getting and overlooking that side is very difficult. So our office was fully involved in ensuring that the corners of the Memorial had um, the right way to get under. And this picture right here 
allows for a person, uh, this is the view from a person that, like myself in a wheelchair that can look over the reflecting pool just like anyone else. So when we're designing anything in our city, we have to ensure that it's accessible for people with disabilities, including the 9-11 Memorial. Um, we have come out with accessibility um, guidelines called our inclusive design guide, guidelines. Um, accessibility is universal and inclusive. And we've come up with um, the first edition and we've come up with the second edition, uh, which is in the middle, that really looks at the Americans with Disabilities Act accessibility guidelines and goes over and beyond the codes and standards everywhere that we possibly can. We look at the way that um, the five foot turning radiuses are there and we actually go into a seven foot ra uh, turning radius, automatic doors, streets and sidewalks, um, smart city technology. And if you think, especially in the world of coronavirus, how automatic doors for people with disabilities, bigger, open, more wide uh, spaces um, are looked after at this point in time, right? Those are all accessibility design standards. And our last standard is our sports and recreation guidelines, really building off the great work that the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation has done um, and looking at our recreation spaces with over and beyond accessibility standards. And all of this is accessible on our website, um, myc.gov slash um, MOPD. And you can find um, these in inclusive and accessible guidelines on our website. I chair the, um, the New York City Building Code Chapter 11 uh, for the Department of Buildings uh, for the accessibility standards. Uh, Rick Bell um, sat on those uh, committees with me um, and it was actually part of the 9-11 Memorial with us as well. Um, he told me the story the other day and uh, I wanna thank Rick for his involvement in that and advocating for the rights of people with disabilities. So we look at the New York City Building Code and ensure that when it's coming through, we can add those accessible guidelines um, that go over and beyond where we can. And right now, the existing building code is coming in and how do we deal with accessibility in older buildings that are there? This is gonna be revolutionary for us because what we usually do is apply the old um, Americans with Disabilities Act codes to existing buildings. But now we're gonna have an existing building standards for accessibility. So we're excited about that moving forward. One of the things that I'm excited about is our housing. These are the type B dwelling units. So really what it allows to, to happen is every building, um, an apartment building that goes up in the city of New York is adaptable, meaning that it has all the turning radiuses that are in there. Um, it allows for uh, reinforcements behind all the walls for accessibility, can remove cabinets uh, to allow for floor spaces. So you can move into a building a brand new building within the city of New York under our building code. And on the face value, it may not look accessible, but you can, um, but you can remove cabinets and have the um, right turning radiuses. You can um, have the uh, reverse the door. So it swings out instead of into the required floor spaces. And you can add all the grab bars that are in there and they are adaptable for people with disabilities. This is some of the ways that we go over and beyond in our housing. I wanna talk a little bit about emerging technologies and ensuring that smart city technology includes people with disabilities. We talked about our streetscapes and this is a vision of mine that I've uh, been having for some time. Um, how do we ensure that it's accessible as we change the streetscape? Generally, um, a person with a visual disability, when crossing the street, listens for traffic. And when we add bike lanes, we actually push that traffic further out onto the street. So it's more difficult for people with visual disabilities to hear the oncoming traffic. Um, so we've added um, accessible pedestrian signals, and you may have heard them on the streets of New York City as they beep 
that allows a person with a disability to know when and when they can't cross the street. But I want to figure out ways that we could add smart LEDs that are on the lights for people with low vision and people with visual disabilities so they know when to cross the traffic. I want to be able to use some of the um, connected devices like connected vehicles, uh, like connected wheelchairs, like wearables that could uh, connect with bikes and scooters that are on the street. So people with disabilities can cross the street in a safe manner. And one of the ways that they, uh, these connected devices can connect with is our, our, our Link NYC that's on the street. And the Link NYC is a great thing on the city of New York that we're so excited about. Why? Because when uh, we were reinventing the payphone, we ensured that accessibility was built into there, making sure that the heights were accessible for people with disabilities, that there was braille on the buttons, that there are talkback features, that there are color contrasts that you can adjust when you get to the screen. And, and the way that you can connect um, on the streets for a person who is deaf. Right now, we're the only city in the world that you can actually go and um, be able to connect with sign language direct. We turned on the camera so someone can get a live interpreter on the streets of New York City. Really cutting edge stuff that we, the city of New York, are leading the charge with. Pretty exciting things. And again, the data that comes in, we know thousands and thousands of people use this a year um, because we've added um, accessibility features on there. I talked about the accessible pedestrian signals that we keep adding on the streets of New York. I'd love to see this be connected to devices and wearables that are on the street. One of the uh, most exciting things that we did um, is Local Law 51 in New York City. So anytime the city of New York puts together a project and it's over $900,000, they must add a hearing loop. And these hearing loops are just basically a coil that goes around a room in an assembly area and at a, at where people um, and, uh, and the public can go to um, and for city government buildings to ensure that these hearing loops go in. We're excited about hearing loop technology. It is part of um, smart city technology. And um, we have just released, and I'm excited about this. We are a major city that has released text to 911 during the pandemic. And why is this so important? Well, it's important because a lot of people who are deaf have to rely on a relay service. And often they, got, they were hung up by um, 911 because they didn't respond quickly enough because of the relay services that was there. Now they can do, um, text to 911 directly um, to, H, um, to all the trained operators um, uh, through, the, through the system because we've trained, trained all of them, which is really important. And for people with speech uh, disabilities as well, people that are hard of hearing as well can text 911. But as people are cohabitating through this pandemic, definitely is a way for people in domestic violence um, to be able to connect to 911 now. And as we look for the next generation of 911, embedding um, interpreting services, uh, American Sign Language, embedding videos. Um, we are making sure that we're part of the process so when they roll out the next gen 911, it's fully accessible for people with disabilities. And um, I think I'm gonna end there um, for my time and I think I'm gonna open it up to questions. Thank you, Victor. This was a uh... Tremendously enlightening and congratulations to New York in being so ahead of the game. I have one question though, and that is that you definitely have emphasized the, um, you have definitely emphasized the whole issue of accessibility. But one of the things that happens when you access something is that at the end, you also have to use it. 
how do you make that little transition between accessing something and the level of usability to what you are asking? I think you hinted at it in a couple of your examples, but that's still a gap that needs to be formally and explicitly closed. Can you talk about that one? Sure. Um, so I want people to understand that it's important to connect with people with disabilities during your design process. This often doesn't happen. I will tell you it does not happen, right? That's a come with the city of New York. We've included disability service facilitators across our agencies. Um, so agencies have someone to work with on the inside. And we work um, throughout the city to make sure that we're all engaged. And then we work with the disabled community as well and roll out these accessibility features and talk about these accessibility features and make sure that people with disabilities are involved in the process. And often through our work and designers, they go out to consultants all the time. Do they really consult and hire people with disabilities? One thing we've noticed is that um, people just want people with disabilities to give their information to them free. No, put your consulting fees in with your jobs to make sure that you hire a consultant that is a person with a disability to be able to get there. Engage with the community constantly throughout the way. And I guarantee your products will, and your, the services that you deliver, your design and construction will be accessible for people with disabilities and you will avoid lawsuits and you will make it more accessible and usable for everyone. Thank you. You're muted, Fenioski. Yes, I noticed that. I was going to talk. Uh, thank you, Victor. V very interesting. And I knew that the, the, the work that you have done and how you have moved New York City in all your years of public service from the Park Department to the um, Office of uh, for Disabilities, um, you, you really have pushed. And I know that our work together, you were always there trying to ensure that we were paying attention. And here is one question from one of our attendants, Katherine Marstoff, um, who is asking you your thoughts on how uh, on changing the culture um, from uh, of people as they see urban spaces. Um, you know, she goes and say, you can add seven feet to the sidewalks and add ramps, but how do you ensure that the public uh, embrace those and don't see it as a challenge or an imposition to them, but it's something that benefits not only the people with disability, but everyone. I think you talk a little bit about the car cuts and all the other. So can you tell you, can you speak a little bit about the cultural change, the perception change, so that it doesn't see the otherness that sometimes are perceived when we are uh, bringing up those changes in design? Yeah, you know, changing culture is hard. Um, and we see that through the social justice movement that that's ramping up more and more now, right? And people want what they want. Um, and so number one, I would, um, let's start with hiring people with disabilities. If you're not seen, you're not heard. And you're not, if you're not heard, you're not seen. So it's important to look at your hiring practices and ensure that you're hiring people with disabilities, right? We talk about hiring diverse because if you have someone, a person of color, um, LGBTQ, men, women, and you spread this out, you're gonna have a much more rich environment, but people with disabilities aren't included in that environment. You need to look at your hiring practices. That's how come if you're looking to hire people with disabilities, our NYC at Work program can certainly um, be able to assist in finding the talent that you're looking for. Uh, number two is making it part of your um, your culture. Um, always talking about disability, engaging with communities as well. Um, always important um, to be able to, um, to to get people with disabilities there. Now, if you don't build for accessibility, you're not going to see people with disabilities on um, with your um, on your streets and your design. But if you build it, people will be there. For sure. Um, I remember uh, when I was working with the parks department and looking at some of the lack of accessibility that was there, but pushing them and pushing them and then getting out there with my kids for accessibility, um, right? Just being able to be any other parent 
with a kid with disability. So just ensuring that it's there, people will come to it and just reinforcing it every step of the way and not putting it in the backfield, making sure that accessibility is the lead on your product. And then we, let me ask, I'm gonna ask some people um, just, just some things that you use on an everyday basis. Um, how many people use talkback features? I mean, how many, you, how many people use um, text to speech or a speech to text on their phone? How many people use captioning um, on Netflix or, or, or all their streaming videos that you put in? How many times do you walk down that curb cut? How many times do you take an elevator? How many times do you go through a store now and that automatic door opens up? And then you walk in and you don't have to touch the door because you're afraid of contracting coronavirus, right? All of those things were built with people with disabilities and you are just reaping the benefits. So inclusive design, hiring people with disabilities, including people with disabilities in there, taking an unconscious bias class and realizing that you do have a bias towards people with disabilities, right? And because our culture tells us that a person with a disability is unable, but that's not the truth. The only thing that makes me disabled is my environment. Make my environment accessible and you will never see disability. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Um, so from the audience, we have some questions that are coming in through the chat. So I'm going to throw one at you, Victor, which I think uh, addresses both the initial question and Penyoski's question as well. Uh, could you comment on universal design versus accessible design? When you start looking around, there are all these nuances of design, but I, all my life, and this comes from Alexandra Wagner, uh, she's asking about that, and it's a very valid question because everything has a label today. So what's the difference between those two? Yeah, yeah, they do, right? We we like to think, right, because there's ADA accessible design, there's inclusive design, there's, uh, uh, there's universal design. So the way that I would sum it up, I mean, in the most simplest form, we like to say inclusive, right? Because it includes everybody. You, um, it's just basically looking at the way that you're doing and not, and so here's a great example. You have a set of stairs and then off to the side, you have a ramp, right? Why not just make that a ramp to go in? That's more of a universal design process, an inclusive design process that we would like to. Like uh, eliminating this and, and not thinking about the code, but just thinking about how it includes everyone and, and not, well, I met the code, because there's a ramp off to the side, right? But no, how do we just make sure it's built right there? I mean, I think that's the simplest way I can break it down. But it makes a lot of sense. Right. Uh, and and the stairs, make the ramp. Yeah. No, no, definitely. And I think that's the, that, that's the very thoughtful way to do it. And again, some people start talking about design, aesthetics, and function, and, and there you go into kind of a rabbit hole sometimes in those type of discussion. But what you're saying is do the right thing, you know, do the right project. Um, and we do have a, a question from Miriam Fisher, um, which talks a little bit about your work that you have um, presented here, both from kind of the transportation arena, the city bikes and, and the like. Um, and she was asking the question is, um, uh, what about bicyclists and those with disabilities? Um, uh, her concern is that there is an increased use of bike uh, biking, uh, which she applauds. Um, but the normal is that a lot of those bicyclists uh, can run red lights and sometimes ride on the sidewalks which endangers and frightens seniors, pedestrians, and people with disability. It also subverts vision zero. Um, so what can be done to ensure that, you know, like you're saying, this is a space that we need to share, you know, all of us uh, be a, a very welcoming, inclusive uh, space so that everybody can enjoy, and particularly nowadays on the days of COVID, you want it like the public open spaces are shared by everybody. So how do you kind of manage or what are your thoughts about managing those situations between the biking 
and uh, the accessibility. So, yeah, it's difficult, right? And we hear this from, um, from the blind community all the time. Uh, people need to take responsibility with this, but we have a way to bridge the gap. And, and, and that's some of the issues that I was talking about in the smart city technology, right? Technology really helps bridge the gap when disability here. And we have to, we have to be able to embed that in, um, in the ways that we look um, at moving forward. So really being able to embed technology so they can connect to connected devices, so, such as someone's smartwatch, such as someone's phone, um, that will let them know that someone's approaching. Um, in evening now that we're going through um, a scooter um, initiative in the city of New York, and we've added standards mm -hmm. that they must look at ways to include people with disabilities. And there's some interesting things that I've been hearing and embedding this technology in those scooters, things with flashing lights and sounds and all of that, that can make them more detectable as we move on. So this will eventually translate over to other accessibilities, especially in these bikes. But I believe it's all about this connected city that we're having, using this smart city technology to drive things. And we have to think about embedding that in. Thank you. Here's another question from the audience. Um, and this opens another dimension to what you're talking about. Everything you have talked about is about today. But this question opens the door for about tomorrow because how is New York City approaching accessibility in the onset of climate change? Uh, we are going to see a lot of effects of climate change, you know, rising sea levels, um, all kinds of things that we're seeing in terms of extreme weather events and everything. Uh, how are the different departments that address all these things working together in your office? That, that's a, actually a very, very good question. And this yeah. comes from Ian Blair. Well, thank you for the question. It, you know, that's a, that's a serious issue, right? Um, um, emergency management around people with disabilities is a serious issue. Why? Because we're the most vulnerable population that's out there. The one that have trouble getting access to, to transportation when we need to get out of those uh, rising sea level zones or uh, finding the appropriate accessible housing if we're, um, we need to move somewhere else, get access to medication and, 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 and everything else that is happening. It's important um, that as we try to worry about rising sea levels, that our office is fully connected through this. I will tell you that my office has plenty of conversations with, um, with everyone throughout the city. When we're talking about building um, seawalls um, along areas such as the East River and East River Park and how we include and embed accessibility in there. So we're part of the conversation. Um, as they build up berms, how do we ensure that accessibility is into those berms? Um, you know, when the, the sea levels, obviously, they're not rising. So we're constantly involved in those conversations. We're connected with DOT. We're connected with planning. Um, we're connecting with Economic Development Corporation. You name it, we're involved. And that leads us, uh, th thank you, uh, Victor. And that leads us to a question that both uh, Lila Durrell and um, Pat Natal um, has brought up. And it's like, it, 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 you know, what can we do from the architectural, engineering, construction, design perspective? Like, for example, uh, Lila mentioned that the city is putting a lot of in incentives to push real um, uh, state developers to go further than the ADA code to include inclusive design as well as wild design. So what the profession, the designers, the architects, the engineers can do to support those initiatives um, and to go beyond of what is required, but actually do the best project possible. Don't forget about disability. Lead with accessibility, lead with universal design, lead with an inclusive design, whatever way you wanna put it, make sure you lead with it. Continue, again, I'm, I'm gonna say it again, I'm gonna drill it in, hire people with disabilities, hire consultants, reach out to, um, to independent living centers in, 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 um, throughout wherever you're located, right? There are independent living centers throughout uh, the country. It's a whole movement 
connect with your independent living centers, connect with advocates, um, engage and, and think that, you know, this could happen um, to you. I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone has or knows of a person with a disability that's either in their family um, or their friends, uh, you know, people with disabilities are everybody. We intersect with race, we re- intersect with gender, we intersect with, uh, uh, with families, you name it, people with disabilities are everywhere. Um, realize that they're part of the conversation and should never be excluded. So another question from the audience has to do with um, your demographic count for the Department of Parks. So this one's a lot more specific because it really illustrates uh, the impressive leadership that it takes to make um, special needs in parks so visible like you were able to share with us. So how would you encourage other, uh, through your leadership role, other organizations to be able to do what you have done? This comes from Janelle Drone. Yeah. Uh, Janelle, you know, it's not easy. Um, when we, when I was hired at the Parks Department, um, the commissioner at the time, um, Adrian Benepe, just felt this was an affront. And he really gave me a top part of the leadership, um, which my boss there was Nancy Barthold, and they let me lead. Um, and they cared about it. And, and that led to the uh, accessibility within the Parks Department. And and, and really their designers and uh, the people that were running their capital programs sort of the, saw the value in this. It's people that actually get it, that actually care and want to make the difference. And that's what it's about, right? Um, right, the, the ADA is standard, right? And the ADA and the accessible guidelines along with the ADA are the floor. Realize that. What we want to achieve is the ceiling, not the floor. So um, the commitment there and the, and the drive by me and the person that is um, uh, in the Parks Department in my old role continues to move forward on accessibility. And their chiefs and designers, they're all for it. And um, it takes a lot of work. It doesn't happen overnight. I've been in government for 14 years. So, um, you know, it's taken a long time to get here. And... Granted, you know, we're, we're not there yet, right? We still got a long way to go. If we look at the Parks Department al- alone, 30,000 acres, 565 large parks and small parks, 1,000 playgrounds, um, right? Uh, 17 miles of beaches, 37 or 38 recreation centers. The list goes on. And that's just in the Parks Department, not over the 200,000 curb cuts or the buildings that the city of New York owns or the... Um, you know, the thousands of restaurants, the over 25,000 restaurants in the city of New York, right? The list goes on. We're a big city. We got a long way to go. Thank you. I, I just want to thank both of you, Victor, and thank you, Jorge, for your presentation and your uh, questions and, and insight. Uh, I really appreciate it. I also would like to thank the collaborating organizations, ACC New York, AIA New York, ASE, CSU, ENR, NAC, NICOA, and NOMA. I also would like to thank the industry leaders, past speakers, and co-moderators that have been uh, present today in the Nicole, Eve Michel from the NPA, Mohamed Sadiq from the Queensboro uh, President Office, Patrick Nakal from Mark McDonald, Vincent Fokoski, uh, the former president of CMA in New York, New Jersey, uh, Dr. Janelle Drone from New York Public Library, uh, Julia Notzi uh, from Helsinki, uh, Kay Santacos from CUNY, and uh, Alessandra Wagner, who has a question from Mark McDonald. So we wanna thank all of you for being here today and particularly all of you out there in the offices, in agencies at home, throughout New York City and around the world for taking time to listen today. Continuing education credits for architects have been requested. If you would like so those, please send your name to cbips at columbia.edu. I also would like to thank the team at Columbia David Chetanawa, uh, Michael um, 
Smith, Rick Bell, without whom this program would not be possible. I also would like to thank John Park uh, for uh, all his support and help for the closed captioning and making it a reality. Today's talk was the concluding lecture in the series of social justice. A special thanks to those who have been here for each one of the lectures. Please join us in January. We are going to start a new lecture series and we are going to send you, we're going to take a break during the holidays, but then in January, we're going to start a new lecture series and we will send you an email with the information. So please enjoy um, and really have a wonderful uh, set of holidays and Take care of yourselves, be safe, and we look forward to see you all um, in January. So thank you so much. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, Jorge, for all for your participation and your great insightful questions. Have a wonderful afternoon. You too. Thank Take you. care.